we've now looked at three of what I think are the most important apophatic writers from the first 12 centuries of Christianity. And I turn now to three others. These are from the late Middle Ages and the early modern times. Meister Eckhart, Jan von Roosbroek, and St. John of the Cross. Of course, it's John about whom I'll be speaking at greatest length. As with Gregory, Dionysius, and William of St. Thierry, far more could be said about any of these than is possible here. I just want to highlight what seems most pertinent in their writings for those who are practicing and teaching centering prayer. You might recall that the chapter devoted to Eckhart in our anthology begins with the statement that he may well be the most frequently quoted mystic in our own day. And several facts lend weight to that claim. In that Paulus series of classics, Eckhart is the only author represented by two separate volumes in a series that now numbers more than 80 authors. And I'm sure the second volume was produced because of great demand. A few years ago, an Eckhart Society was founded in England to promote the study of his thought, and numerous books and articles have been appearing in recent years about Eckhart. One of the most highly acclaimed scholarly enterprises of this entire century has been the beautiful critical edition of his Latin and German works. So who was this man? And more importantly, what does he have to say to us today? Eckhart was born near Erfurt in Saxony around the year 1260, and while still in his teens, entered the Dominican order. In accord with the basic Dominican aim of providing well-trained teachers and preachers for the church, he was first sent to study in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Paris, which was then the leading university in Northern Europe. He afterwards studied theology at the Dominican's own house of studies in Cologne, where he may have been a student of St. Albert the Great. In any case, he several times refers to St. Albert, who had himself written a lengthy commentary on Dionysius's mystical theology, and who therefore contributed in a major way to the spread of apophatic thought in medieval times. After finishing his studies, Eckhart spent the rest of his life dividing his time among three major activities. Teaching theology back in Paris, serving as a leading administrator for the German provinces of his order, and preaching to congregations of nuns and laypersons throughout the Rhineland. Shortly after his death, around the year 1328, some propositions from his writings were condemned as heretical by Pope John XXII, while others of these propositions were called evil-sounding and very rash and suspect of heresy. Ever since, this man has been a controversial figure. He has strong defenders who claim that he was simply misunderstood, and equally strong detractors who feel that he just got carried away by Neoplatonic theories that are incompatible with Christian orthodoxy. For our present purposes, we don't have to enter into the details of that debate, but it is important to look at this apophatic element in his works, an element which the leading Eckhart scholar Bernard McGinn has called absolutely central. One of Eckhart's favorite scriptural texts was the very first words of John's Gospel, in the beginning. In one of his German sermons, he comments that this first beginning was for the sake of the last end, that to which everything is tending. And to the question, what is the last end, he gives the following answer. It is the hidden darkness of the eternal divinity and it is unknown, and it was never known, and it will never be known. God remains there within himself, unknown, and the light of the eternal Father has eternally shone in there, 
and the darkness does not comprehend the light. If this is so, one would expect that Eckhart would at times counsel his readers and hearers not even to attempt to say anything about this hidden God. And that's precisely what he does occasionally do. In another of the German sermons, he refers to the inadequacy of all human language in speaking about God. Since he, since he says, such terms as good, better, and best are all alien to God, who is superior to them all. And he then continues, even if I say God is a being, it's not true. He transcends being and is a transcending nothingness. About this, St. Augustine says, the best that one can say about God is for one to keep silent out of the wisdom of one's inward riches. So be silent and do not chatter about God. For when you do chatter about him, you're telling lies and sinning. Well, then you might ask, why did Eckhart himself write so much about God and our relationship with God? Now, the probable answer, at least as I understand it, goes right to the heart of his theology. And it's indicated by one of the ways he defended himself when he was first tried for heresy in Cologne. We have the text of his response, which includes the following claim. My inquisitors think that God exists and creates in another now than the now of eternity, although the world was created in time. They do not know what Augustine says. All tomorrows and beyond them, and all yesterdays and what is behind them, you, Lord, are making today and have made today. What is it to me if someone does not understand this? In other words, Eckhart was constantly aware of the distinction between time and eternity, and in addition, held that there is an aspect of our being which is itself eternal, sharing in God's eternity. This aspect he called our virtual being, as distinct from what he called our formal being created in time and space. That virtual being has been in the mind of God from all eternity and represents our truest self to which we're called to return. So then, if one speaks out of that dimension of one's being, the words will not produce what Eckhart scorns as mere chatter about God, but will be words full of God's own life and power. And Eckhart believed that was the way he was speaking. As he writes in his best-known sermon, number 52, which again is in the anthology, in breaking through to the divine ground, I am above all created things, and I am what I was and what I shall remain now and eternally. In this breaking through, I receive that I and God are one. It was this same insight that led to other bold statements of the sort that got him accused of heresy. And one can indeed understand the fears of the leaders of the church of his day. Still, it's important to keep in mind that his insistence on the awesome vocation of each of us to return to God and his insistence on God's earnest desire that we attain that union are unassailable Catholic truths and were often expressed by him in words that still touch us deeply. Take the following passage from one of his German sermons. If a person humbles himself, God cannot withhold his own goodness, but must come down and flow into the humble person. And to him who is least of all, God gives himself the most of all. What God gives is his being, and his being is his goodness, and his goodness is his love. All sorrow and joy come from love. On the way when I had to come here today to preach, I was thinking I did not want to come, because I would become wet with tears of love. 
Sometimes a person thinks he can flee from God, and yet he cannot. Every corner where he may go reveals God to him. He thinks that he's fleeing God and runs right into his lap. God bears his only begotten Son in you whether you like it or not. Whether you're sleeping or waking, God is doing his part. If we had divine love, God and all the works that God ever performed would taste good to us, and we would receive all things from God and would perform all the same works that God performs. Here again, we have a teaching that is utterly foundational for the practice of centering prayer or any truly Christian contemplation. God is always with us, calling us, bearing the only begotten Son in us, drawing us back to our truest self in the very being of God. When one is really aware of this, it is obvious that chattering about God, trying to pin God down in images and concepts, is counterproductive. What is most needful is humility, detachment, openness, and love. Where those attitudes exist, we can be sure that one will be filled with the very goodness of God. And let's turn now to a near contemporary of Eckhart, Jan van Roosbroek, the greatest of the medieval Flemish mystics. Born in 1293 in a village a few kilometers southwest of Brussels, he was sent as a young boy to study under the tutelage of a clerical relative at the largest church in Brussels. Ordained a priest at the age of 24, Roosbrook spent the next quarter century at the same church, working unobtrusively, but composing a number of treatises to help combat what he perceived as the doctrinal errors of a movement known as that of the free spirit. Then, at the age of 50, he and a couple like-minded confrères retired to a secluded former hermitage in the forest of Grunendal, southeast of the city, where they eventually became Augustinian canons. And during the final 38 years of his long life, Jan van Roosbroek lived in this sylvan setting, receiving visitors who would come to him for spiritual counsel from all over northern Europe, and continuing to, to compose treatises that have come to be recognized as classic works of Christian mysticism. Four of the most important of these are available in one of the volumes of that classics series from Paulus Press, a volume that I myself edited. Those who have carefully studied this man's works are agreed that he presents a marvelous synthesis of all that was best in the Christian spiritual tradition up to his day. Some of his expressions are as starkly apophatic as anything one could find in Dionysius or Eckhart. In the concluding part of his major treatise, The Spiritual Espousals, he writes, for example, that the genuine contemplative will lose himself in a state devoid of particular form or measure a state of darkness in which all contemplatives blissfully lose their way and are never again able to find themselves in a creaturely way. For Roosbrook, however, more explicitly than some other authors in the apophatic tradition, this darkness is never the last word. Indeed, he follows the passage just quoted by saying that in the abyss of this darkness, in which the loving spirit has died to itself, God's revelation and eternal life have their origin. For in this darkness, an incomprehensible light is born and shines forth. This is the Son of God, in whom a person becomes able to see and to contemplate eternal life. And there's another point that should also be mentioned in this regard. At this part of his treatise, The Spiritual Espousals, he writes movingly of the restful bliss that a true contemplative will be experiencing 
on being taken up into that bond of love that unites Father and Son in the Holy Spirit. He does not, however, in this particular part of his work, say anything about the way such a person will relate to other human beings. And it seems that he recognized this deficiency when he composed his next treatise, The Sparkling Stone. For he there writes that there is a mode of life that goes even beyond what he had earlier described as the pinnacle of Christian life in the spiritual espousals, what he there called contemplative life. This other mode he calls the common life. Common, not in the sense of ordinary, but rather in the sense of going out to everyone in common without playing favorites. He presents this as the fullness of Christian living, <clears throat> saying that anyone who has attained it will always flow forth to all who need him. For the living spring of the Holy Spirit is so rich that it can never be drained dry. Such a person is a living and willing instrument of God with which God accomplishes what he wishes in the way he wishes. This is surely an important admonition for us who are attracted to contemplative prayer. Ruzbuk was very aware of the danger of just quietly resting in the peace of such prayer and ignoring other aspects of Christian life. This was, in fact, what he perceived as the main error of that free spirit movement. With characteristic judiciousness, he explains the danger in the following words. The rest which one attains in this state of emptiness is both satisfying and deep. In itself it's not sinful, for it arises naturally in everyone whenever he empties himself of activity. But if a person seeks to practice and possess it without performing works of virtue, then he falls into spiritual pride and a state of self-complacency from which hardly anyone ever recovers. That Ruzbrook himself avoided this danger is evident not only from his writings, but from his very way of life. Although he was a genuine contemplative, he was always at the disposal of the many visitors who came to seek his advice at Grunendal. He served his religious community there for many years by filling the office of prior and taking upon himself many of the most unpleasant and laborious tasks, cleaning out the latrines. He gave great care to the composition of treatises of spiritual direction for particular persons or groups within the church. In sum, he joined the love of God and love of neighbor in a way that showed his practical understanding of what Jesus meant when he said that the second commandment is likened to the first. His life, as well as his writings, clearly have much to teach us today. And now in this final part of this lecture, I come to the writer about whom I will be speaking at greatest length, a man often called the mystic's mystic, John of the Cross. I suppose his very name might sound forbidding, and a number of readers have surely had the same reaction as the pastor of a congregational church in Massachusetts, who once wrote to Thomas Merton asking for advice on how to read this 16th century Carmelite reformer. Although that pastor felt drawn by John's writings, he was at the same time repelled by what seemed to be the almost superhuman demands that John placed on his readers. One thinks, for example, of that passage in our anthology in which John asks us to try always to be inclined not to the easiest, but to the most difficult, not to the most delightful, but to the harshest, not to the most gratifying, but to the less pleasant not to wanting something, but to wanting nothing. No one could deny that this is bracing advice, but it's crucial to read the following paragraph, where John assures us that if you put these counsels into practice with order and discretion, you will discover in them 
great delight and consolation. What is of most interest to us at this institute, however, is of course the apophatic side of John's thought. And while this is evident at numerous places in his prose commentaries, it's even clearer in some of his poems. It's also fitting that we consider him first and foremost as a poet, for he was indeed one of the very greatest who ever wrote in the Spanish language. Here are some stanzas from one of his poems entitled, Stanzas Concerning an Ecstasy Experienced in High Contemplation. As you listen to it, note the similarities with what we have already seen in figures like Gregory of Nyssa, Dionysius, and Rusbrook. John writes, I entered into unknowing, yet when I saw myself there, without knowing where I was, I understood great things. I will not say what I felt, for I remained in unknowing, transcending all knowledge. That perfect knowledge was of peace and holiness, held at no remove in profound solitude. It was something so secret that I was left stammering, transcending all knowledge. This knowledge and unknowing is so overwhelming that wise men disputing can never overthrow it, for their knowledge does not reach to the understanding of not understanding, transcending all knowledge. And if you should want to hear, this highest knowledge lies in the loftiest sense of the essence of God. This is a work of his mercy, to leave one without understanding, transcending all knowledge. Especially significant, in my opinion, is that third to last line, this is a work of his mercy. Even when John's describing the most terrible trials of what he calls the night of the spirit, when one feels abandoned with, by God and can only say with Job, why have you set me against you? And I am heavy and burdensome to myself. John insists that this is a necessary purification brought about by a loving and merciful God. In his words, how amazing it is that the soul be so utterly weak and impure that the hand of God light and gentle, should feel so heavy and contrary. For the hand of God does not press down or weigh on the soul, but only touches it. And it does this mercifully. For God's aim is to grant it favors and not chastise it. Here, I think, is where John's doctrine can be especially helpful to those who are practicing centering prayer. As he teaches so clearly in the words just quoted, the pain that we sometimes experience in the spiritual life is not something brought about by a harsh and vengeful God. It's rather a sign of our own lack of full health. When in the course of our prayer, we come more squarely face to face with conflicts, which may long have been buried in our unconscious, we may be tempted to give in to discouragement, even give up on the prayer. As Father Thomas writes in Open Mind, Open Heart, it takes courage to face up to the process of self-knowledge, but it's the only way of getting in touch with our true identity and ultimately with our true self. John helps give us that courage by proclaiming his conviction that God's touch is always merciful and that the purification we undergo at times is all part of God's aim to grant us favors, ultimately the favor of that full union with God that John and his good friend Teresa of Avila regularly call the spiritual marriage. That, and even more about what he says about purification, we will look at now in my next lecture. <laughs>